Welcome to the Insight Podcast. My guest today is Colette Fox. Colette is a part of ProVeg UK, a non-profit food awareness organisation. She leads their School Plates programme, working directly with schools and local authorities all over the UK to support them to make small changes that make a big difference to children's health, the planet and save money, all at the same time. We chat about how our food choices can affect the world's most urgent problems, climate change and health, the role school meals play in fighting climate change and improving children's health, the current state of school meals, addressing people's concerns around getting enough nutrients and protein, how to encourage children to eat more fibre-filled, planet-friendly foods, and much more. Enjoy the episode. So the the mission of ProVeg is summed up really nicely, I think, on the website when it says, many of the world's most urgent problems share a common cause, our food choices. Can you tell me a bit more about that, Colette? You know, can you tell me a bit more about ProVeg and its vision? Yeah, of course. Um, So so ProVeg International is a global um, food awareness, food systems change organisation. We're active in 10 countries across four continents. One of those bases is here in the UK. So we have ProVeg UK that kind of feeds into the global um, system. And, you know, collectively, our mission is to reduce the global consumption of animals by 50 percent by 2040. We do that in all sorts of different ways. Um, But in terms of, you know, the big why, um, it's animal agriculture is the problem here. Um, It's responsible for at least... 20% 20% of fifth of greenhouse gas emissions, um, which actually is more than the entire global transport system combined. So um, while everybody's worrying about, you know, not flying and taking the train and walking more, actually the kind of a, a bigger impact thing they can do is ch- with what they choose to eat. Um, and I think, you know, animal agriculture is also the leading cause of deforestation, water use, biodiversity loss species extinction so there's loads of reasons um to be kind of moving in this direction plus all the experts are telling us this is what we need to do we need to reduce our uh, our meat consumption and we need to get more fiber for our health mm-hmm. so we've got the climate change committee the national food strategy the eat lancet report i mean it just goes on every day practically there's a new report telling us the same thing so yeah that's that's really the direction we need to go in and we're just here to try and help do that yeah and doing amazing work and for those those two reasons the the health of us physically and and mentally our health our children's health but also the health of the planet these are the reasons why it's so important that we're eating more of these fantastic plant-based ingredients and reducing or even eliminating our consumption of animal products and so of course schools play a massive role in that don't they thousands of children are eating in schools every day um and you you lead the school plates program don't you so can you tell me then a bit more about that program um what are its aims and and what, what do you do with schools yeah sure so so i mentioned the kind of global um you know, mission and and each country takes on its own way that it's going to tackle that. So in the UK, we completely focus on school food. We think that is where we're going to change behaviours and and the future behaviours of the population. So School Plates is the name of the programme that we run. And essentially the aims are to make school food both healthier for children, for children's health and for planetary health. So more sustainable food. Um, What we're also finding, which is a kind of third bonus point if you like is that it saves money as well so that's not the reason we do it but it's a lot of the feedback we get um and essentially we support caterers so that's our target audience if you like the school caterers because they are looked up to by children they Mm -hmm. put the food out every day they're very influential if we can get them on board and get them embracing you know plant-based food having a bit less meat and, and the reasons behind it 
and not just being asked to do something extra on top of all the things they already have to do. They can be great ambassadors for children at lunchtime and, you know, be positive about the food. Hopefully it's things they've tried themselves and they can kind of, um, you know, be inspire the kids to want to, to have that, that food as well. Um, and I guess the program itself, we're, we're a not for profit organization. We're donor funded. So all of our services are free. We want it to always remain that way. So, um, you know, everybody is welcome to access our help, but we do a few key things. So we, um, we do kind of menu consultancy, if you like. We mm. get schools and, and councils to send us in their menus and we just do a review um, against our program action. So we're looking at, you know, what are they doing on the menus? Where are dishes positioned? How are they described? So it's all these kind of little tweaks that nudge children to pick the kind of preferable dish, if you like. Um, but we also create recipes. Um, so we have a recipe resource, which is free and can be downloaded on our website and everything has been done with those. They all meet the nutrition standards for schools. They're costed. So we know they're cheap. Um, they have all the nutrition information They, you know, they're well balanced and we've got a carbon rating for everything too. So we know it's all good for the planet as well as good for health. Um, and then I guess from, from the recipes came the request for training, how to make the recipes. Mm. So again, we're just responding all the time to what the need is. Um, so we run in-person workshops where we have a plant-based chef, Lisa, who goes out, the two of us go, we travel around often in the hot school holidays and we train the catering teams of those councils that we're working with. Um, and we kind of infuse them. We bring them up to, up to speed on the facts um, and we get them cooking the dishes and then we sit down and we have lunch and eat it and say what we think about it all. And it, it's really nice experience. And then we've also created a sort of online version for individual schools, because again, mm -hmm. we can't get out to every school in the UK, but they can come to us and we kind of do a bite sized version of the training. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, so we're working with, um, I think the latest numbers are about 40 major catering partners, about nearly 20% of local authorities in England. Um, and that's over 5,000 schools and over 800,000 children. And we've so far swapped over 8 million meals from being meat-based to either meat-free or plant-based. So, yeah, that's, wow. a, that's school plates in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, and having a real impact and all those different approaches that you're taking. Um, like you said, those, those subtle things um, that I remember when we've spoken in the past and when I've looked at the, the School Plates website, finding out about those little changes that you can make to, to menus, just the position of things on a menu, the positions of food and how it's presented. And of course, how, how the staff and the, the, the canteen um, staff are, are talking about those dishes as well. Because um, it, it can be that um, perhaps the, the plant-based dish is kind of like is the, is the other option, isn't it? It's the second option. It's like, oh, I guess you could have that, but this is the, this is the better option. Um, and it's like, no, no, we need to, we need to flip that script a bit, don't we? And totally, um, yeah. like you said, you, you've got nutritious, colourful, delicious food that we want children to be eating more of for their health and the, the health of the planet. Yeah, that's it. it it's normalising it. It's just, you know, yeah. it's not a thing that vegetarian or vegan kids eat. It's it's food, delicious yeah. food, making sure it's delicious and it's not inferior, like you say. I'm, I'm giving it a fair chance that kids will choose it and then actually they tend to really like it. Yeah, well, who yeah. knew? It's just good food, <laughs> <laughs> and and they want it, don't they? And, and children are more um, climate conscious, especially I guess the teenage children in secondary schools. They're more aware of this, and they're wanting to do their part, and they're hearing things um, on the news, and they're seeing things on social media, and they want these options. But sometimes they just they don't have them in front of them, do they? And and so they're not sure where to turn. Um, yeah. So that's another reason why I think it's so important to be getting this in schools and educating the canteen staff. Who I'm guessing every time you do. This, training are really well you, you already mentioned that they're very enthusiastic and uh, when we were chatting just before I hit record I was talking about the the um the, the head cook at, at, at my school and she's very enthusiastic about it always asking me for new recipes plant-based recipes that Brilliant. she can start serving and that's what we want isn't it keep that keep that momentum going yeah, totally <laughs> So I guess it might be interesting to to 
take a bit of a step back and think, well, where, where, what's the current state of, of school meals at the moment? You're doing this fantastic work um, in with improving recipes and, and, and that. But what, what is the current state of school meals? Are they, are they not just fine? Are they not very climate friendly at the moment? Are they not very healthy at the moment? What, what's yeah, it like? it's, a good, it's a good question, Sam. I think the short answer is it's very mixed. Um, I mean, we get an insight into this because we, we review menus all the time. Um, I think tip, a typical menu, we see a lot of processed meat on there, um, which, you know, processed meat is a group one carcinogen. It causes cancer. Um, if we were designing school menus now, would we put a group one carcinogen food that we're feeding our children? I would argue that's not a good idea. Um, we've got the cost of living crisis. So again, you know, some of the kind of quality of ingredients is slipping and, you know, maybe mm. where caterers have kind of phased out or got better quality meat, that's that's just not possible. I, I speak to people all the time and they're like, we absolutely can't put certain things on, you know, they can't put red meat on, it's just too expensive. Um, I think, so that's kind of one thing we see, we see, you know, most menus have a vegetarian option. As you said, it's usually underneath the 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 meat or the fish option um and we know from research you know people humans choose the top dish more than they choose the second mm. dish so we, we obviously play around with that but just in terms of those vegetarian options they're very cheesy everything is about cheese yeah. typically it's pizza it's pasta with cheese it's a cheesy pastry something or other um which you know sounds sounds delicious if you like cheese but it's not really that um well thought out um, and we can, we can do better and we don't need to just have cheese all the time. So again, we're trying to get in, you know, whole food, plant-based ingredients, pulses, lentils, chickpeas, um, tofu, if we're going really wild, but we mm. have got, we've got councils that do, they serve tofu and jackfruit and all sorts of things and the kids love it. So, um, yeah, th- th- there's, there's a lot that can be done, but we've also got schools, um, that are doing fantastic things. I mean, we've got loads of examples of those and they're just outstanding. So we want to shout about those ones in terms of what's possible. Um, one thing we've sort of just recently created is our School Plates Awards because we want to kind of recognise um, caterers, whether whether you're an individual school or whether you're a council or a multi-academy trust that are taking positive steps and are, you know, trying. It might be baby mm. steps and it might be slowly but it's all to be acknowledged and praised. So we've, yeah, we've set up our awards, which are free to enter any school. Anybody in school catering can enter those. You just have to send us your menu. There's no cutoff date. We review it. We give you some hopefully useful feedback and you can see which things you're sort of ticking off on the list. And eventually that builds you towards getting like a school plates bronze award or a silver. So we're just kind of seeing our first um, awards at the moment we haven't announced any yet but we've got several schools and partners that are just about to get their first awards which is brilliant so I would encourage anyone listening to to get involved in that yeah yeah definitely schools love an award they love a bronze silver Absolutely. or gold so that's a, it's a great approach <laughs> and, it's and it funny. sounds like it's <laughs> yeah, it's free. Yeah, they love that as well. Yeah. Um, but it also it sounds like it's very kind of incremental as well. It's small, small yeah. steps, small changes, keep Absolutely. building on them. And yeah. then we can get to the point where we're serving very healthy, but of course still delicious and nutritious food. Yeah. Brilliant. And so what um these changes that we're making, just just how much of an impact can they make on on children's health and on the planet? I mean, I guess you've you've already touched on some of these. Uh, the numbers and some of the, the the stats around that, but is there anything else you would you would add? Like, how much of a difference do, does this menu do these menu changes make? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a, another really good question. I think it's it's very difficult to measure. You know, from what yeah. we're doing, what exactly are the health impacts? Because nothing has been done. There are studies underway. I talked to lots of researchers, and there are you know, there's things happening in this area, but we just know that the less animal products we eat and the more plant-based products we eat, the best that is for our health. We're getting more nutrients, um, especially with children. You know, we've got a huge childhood obesity problem um, in England and it's similar in the other nations as well in the UK. Almost a quarter of children starting school in England are obese or overweight. And by the time they get to 
10 years old, that's gone up to over a third. So having a bit more fiber, a bit more fruit and veg pulses helps to kind of get to a healthy weight and to alleviate um, that issue. And also, you know, it, this comes down to the fiber, <laughs> which mm-hmm. everybody gets quite fixated on protein with plant-based food. But I always say, forget the protein, we get plenty of protein. And, uh, you know, you will typically get plenty of protein on a plant-based diet. What we lack um, is fiber. And that's the most important thing. Um, it creates a healthy gut microbiome. It helps us fight off COVID, flu, or infections. Um, and it also reduces our risk massively of loads of, um, you know, long term lifestyle diseases like cancers, some cancers, type 2 diabetes, stroke, hypertension, heart disease. I mean, you name it, it all has the same impact. So we mm-hmm. want to set kids up for being healthier and not being sicker as they get older. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's super important on the health side of things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, like you said, everyone's getting enough pro- protein. We don't need to worry about that. Yeah. People sometimes come up to me in the gym, like, they're, they're, they're like some people in the gym know know that I'm fully plant based, and I was like, "It's like, where are you getting all your protein from? Are you taking protein shakes?" I'm like, oh, honestly, I do not give it a second thought. I, I realize that protein is important, yeah, and course. I need to be aware of having a, a, a varied diet and, and including sources of protein but I don't think about it and I don't measure it. I just know that the amount of um, beans I'm eating, the amount of um, all these, are like the, the tofu that I'm eating, yeah. I, I know that the amount of nuts, the, I know that I'm getting plenty of protein and I don't need any extra protein shakes or anything to kind of fuel my no. lifestyle. I, I, but anyway, I'm, sorry, I go on. Say, I just had a, I had a conversation a couple of days ago, actually, with one of our partners um, who was worried about the protein they were they were looking to sort of reduce the meat in some of their dishes and they were looking at what the quantity should be and you know so I was explaining actually it's it's pretty much the same if you've got beef mints versus you know lentils and soy protein it comes out almost the same on protein um, and just highlighting the fact that even having like a side of vegetables having peas with something you know a, a primary school portion gives you four grams of protein if you have mm-hmm. a fruit crumble with oats and berries and apple that gives you another four grams of protein so you don't have yeah. to get it from meat and you don't have to just get it from pulses it's like it's in everything everything has yeah. got this in so we've got a bit of an issue with the, the the kind of nutrition guidelines because i think they're not actually that clear and therefore we've got caterers that are confused and thinking you know kids need 50 grams of protein with their school lunch and i'm saying to them no 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 that's like an adult's needs for the that's day a lot, yeah um so yeah we'd love to kind of overhaul those a little bit and just make it clearer and easier for, for caterers to understand what they should be doing and it's yeah. a bit sketchy on the the plant-based vegetarian front compared to meat right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then, and then the other point you made about fiber is what we should be focusing on, isn't it? Isn't it? Because yeah. most people are not getting near near the right amount of fiber, and you only have to kind of glance through lunch boxes and and, and at school meals to understand that, and to look at the the snacks that children are eating. They're just quite often, aren't they, processed or refined um, refined grains, white bread, white rice, yeah. and all, all these things. They're just just not getting that that fiber content that we know is is so important for our our health and well being. And so this is just it just makes it so easy to to get that amount of fiber, isn't it? If you start adding more plants to your diet and making some simple swaps to include more of these plant-based ingredients, you just very quickly see your fiber intake rise. You see yourself getting the, that whole variety of plants that we know is so important for our gut microbiome. We should aim yeah. for 30, I think, plants a week, mm-hmm. isn't it? Week, yeah. And mm-hmm. you, you just you just hit it so quickly without even thinking about it. Yeah. So there's just there's so many reasons why this is such a good approach. And I think one of the basic things we always talk about, you know, which again, that we can't assume people know this, you only get fiber from plants. So if you want to get more fiber, that's what you've got to be eating. And naturally, that kind of pushes something else that you're eating out a bit, because actually fiber fills you up. So you don't want to eat so much of the other stuff. So hopefully, it just kind of it's a natural evolution, as people start to eat a bit more of the good, the good whole foods. 
<laughs> and so have you got any like stories or testimonials or anything like that from from a, from a whole school or maybe from individual parents children teachers anything like that where someone has come back to you and said like th- this is what's happened since this program was introduced or this is what happened since we- we've made some of these swaps do, do you ever get that feedback we do get feedback because we don't work directly with kids. We don't get it firsthand. We often get it via the caterers and we're obviously always asking and, you know, can we get any feedback or if there's something happening? So we do have on our website, we've got some case studies and we've got some quotes there from children about what they think about the food. Um, mm. We, I'm going to do a, a, a little plug here for a program that we were <laughs> involved in recently, which has got loads of feedback from kids and parents and I would thoroughly recommend because it, it's all about this topic of do we need to be having more plant-based school food um so it's on um, BBC Inside Science and it's it's if you have a look on the BBC website it's on there it's just a half an hour program but it's got some lovely quotes from kids um at a school in Lancashire um mm. where the head teacher decided they were going to go a lot more plant-based and veggie and reduce the meat right down still complying with the school food standards um and of course there were you know this was maybe not the community you would think this thing is going to work in but it's worked beautifully it's been totally accepted kids love the food um the parents which you hear on the the podcast say you know we thought the kids wouldn't eat it because they're quite fussy eaters but actually they do they love it and they come home and now they're making that food at home so it has this kind of snowball effect if the if you can present it well and make a good dish children will eat it they don't think about it with a label that it's meat or it's vegetables or whatever as long as it's good and they like it they'll have it and then they will pass that on and take it home so that all has a knock-on effect on planet health um so yeah but if you want some lovely little snippets straight from the the little mouths then i (laughs) i recommend having a listen to that program on inside science um yeah yeah, definitely says it all Great. Yeah. And I can put a link to that in the show notes. So if you're listening, you can just uh, click on this episode and you'll be able to find that and, and tune in. And I'm looking forward to tuning yeah. into that as well. Great and it, it, it's just interesting because I think we have these assumptions, don't we, about children that are, oh no, no, my, my child won't, won't eat that. Like I know they wouldn't eat that. They wouldn't like that. And actually like, are, are we restricting them there? And are we, are we not actually giving them the chance to try new food and experiments and, and see, and like you said, often they, they do love it and they, they love the colour and they love the fact that it's new. And maybe sometimes, yeah, they don't like it right away, but then, you know, you, you serve it again and again and again. And then eventually, um, you know, we, even adults, we don't necessarily want to try a food that we've only seen for the first time. But yeah. you, you keep keep at it, don't you? And then, and then you, you find that you really like it. So I think we just need to give children more of a chance, don't we? Yeah, totally. I think... Um you know, it's certainly much easier if you're trying to get kids to eat plant-based food where they're not used to it, to try them with familiar foods. Think, you know, Mm. if they like lasagna, for example, if they like curry or noodles or whatever it is, do a version really similar, but switch it a little bit to put some more plant-based ingredients. That works. If you present something that's completely alien, of course, they're going to think this is the wrong shape. It's the wrong color you know, that's what kids are like often. Um, but the tasting thing, keep trying it is really important. Yeah. And that's where it works really well. So we've got partners who have tasting sessions after lunch, you know, not every day, but they'll bring out the new dishes that they're planning to put on their next menus. And then mm. kids have a little teaspoon and they put a sticker on to vote on their favorite one. So then that the one that's most popular is the one that goes on the menu so you've immediately got that acceptance of children they've tried it before they voted for it they put it there so you better (laughs) eat it now because you said you liked it and and it just works um and i just think the more you can do around getting kids used to touching tasting smelling trying you know there's all different varieties of tomatoes apples courgettes whatever it is if there's one you don't like there might be another one so you just got to you've just got to try it. And we don't often have a great selection of these things in the supermarket. Um, But I also just wanted to mention another organization, if I can, which I'm a huge fan of. um, And if you know, you you probably know of them, Sam, Taste Ed. 
Um, so they are, so their website is tasteeducation.com. And again, mm. in terms of just educating children about these things, they have a, a you know load of materials that you can download for free to do as lessons in schools. Um, and just, you know, lots of lessons that they've already prepared around certain fruits and vegetables. And it's all about using and engaging kids' senses. So they, you know, it's almost like you touch it and you describe what it feels like. And does it feel lumpy or smooth or, you know, what does it smell like? And the final stage, once you've been through all the, st- all of the senses is the, if you now want to try some, if you want to taste it, you can, but you don't have to. So that, but right. by that point, they're kind of really intrigued and they want to yeah. give it a go. So I think on an individual ingredient level, it's just the most awesome program. And then on a school food level, you need to do the same thing. You need to get kids just trying, trying the food. Yeah. But yeah. Well, that's really interesting. No, I haven't heard of them, but I'm definitely going to check them out. Yeah, but it's such a good point. Good. Yeah. Just, just letting children explore those foods, try them if they want to, I guess from a young age as well. I think I remember being in primary, one of my earliest memories is primary school. I think we did the ancient Romans and our teacher gave us like foods to try. And I think I can remember trying olives and trying hummus and just oh, wow. not liking them at all <laughs> and just thinking, no, 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 I don't like these. But, you know, now like I absolutely love olives and yeah. I probably eat hummus every single day. But yes. back when I tried it when I was seven years old, I couldn't stand it. <laughs> then I think the point you made about the um, you know, familiar foods and you're just making the swaps yeah but it's a familiar food like lasagna, like other mm-hmm. pasta dishes and sauces, what, whatever it is, uh, curries. And th- that's it, isn't it? And I think that's somewhere where adults as well can fail, not fail, yeah. that might be the wrong word, but can kind of um, encounter some resistance when they want to make some changes. But then they think, oh, I've got to make all these fancy new recipes now mm-hmm. and I've got to make this tofu stir fry dish and I don't know all these other things that you see on social media that look amazing and I I try and share the message no no just think about what you normally cook and just swap something out get some more extra lentils in there extra chickpeas whatever it is extra vegetables broccoli whatever it is and you just find you know it it tastes the same the, the texture is similar and you know but but it's much healthier it's much much yeah. better for you much better for the planet and, and for adults i mean you can always make a list of ingredients and you just go through it and what do you like on that list you don't have to eat the things you don't like because you should or because it's got this nutrient i mean if you don't like it you're not going to enjoy it and you won't eat it again so you're better off to start out with a list even if it's short of things you do like like is hummus you know hummus is fairly acceptable um is broccoli okay? Well, let's try broccoli. And then maybe from broccoli, you can move on to spinach or, yeah, it's yeah. just taking those small steps. And it's the same with, with children. That's exactly what we try and do. Just do it bit by bit. Yeah, definitely. And so what about something that you, you've, you've met, mentioned briefly as well, which is some concerns from parents. Um, you mentioned the, the, the BBC documentary that, you know, that community, it might have been, a place where it's not very well received and that parents might be concerned that children could be missing out on certain key nutrients. And we've already touched upon protein as well. So how, how do you address those concerns? Um, again, it's a, it's a good question. I think, to be honest, we don't really, we don't get it so much, I have to say, because um, we almost bring, bring it up immediately to kind of dispel that myth that that isn't the right. case. Um, so we kind of set the record straight from the outset about, you know, you are not going to be lacking in protein, that the plant foods are rich in all sorts of nutrients. Um, and in the recipe book that we've created, which I mentioned, we've got a whole section on nutrients and what those nutrients do, why you need them, which ingredients you get them from. And then obviously the recipes have been created to incorporate those into it. I think um, so. It doesn't really, I think it's a problem outside of schools that, you know, adults maybe have this perception. I did before I switched mm-hmm. to having a plant based diet. That was my concern. But um, in school, in the school setting, I think the concern is that kids won't like it and they won't eat right. the food. That's the concern. And, and you know, it's a genuine um it, it, it's perfectly reasonable that caterers would have that. They are worried kids are going hungry or that the food's going to be wasted. You know, those are the two the two things really. So 
Um, that's why we have to get them on board with it and get them to understand and try it themselves. And then this going back to what we've already talked about, that you get kids to try it. You know, there's no mm. point putting out a plant-based dish if it's rubbish and it's bland. And, you know, that's the opposite of what we want to do. We want to make it amazing food that everybody's going to love and that kids can have at school and the parents can have at home. And, you know, we eat this food ourselves. It's lovely. And we're always looking for new recipes. So I think that is the, you know, that's the key thing. You know, we've we've tried to do that hard work in terms of nutrients, but actually it's not difficult. Even if you have like a jacket potato and beans, you're still getting, you know, some good stuff going on in there in terms of nutrients. But, you know, it, it's all about, like you said, the variety and having as many different um, ingredients over the course of the week. That's what we're, that's the goal anyway. Yeah. We, we work towards it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's great to hear you kind of, you get ahead of people and actually just present the information and, you know, so you've kind of answered the questions before they even come up. Yeah. And I think it's, also interesting to think that you know the current state of what many children are eating it's kind of well, well what are we comparing it to uh, your parents people might be worried about um the nutritional content of this food that we want to introduce but if we're comparing that to the the ham sandwich that's on white bread and the cookie and that's all they're eating for yeah. for lunch I think there's there's not many things that you could serve that wouldn't be an improvement on that, is there? Yeah. Like that is just the least nutritious thing that you could give children, and that is very common to see in school canteens. Yeah, I know everybody <laughs> picks on the new anything that's new, but actually a lot of what's there is you know it, I don't want to criticise because I think caterers are doing a great job and they have a oh, very challenging course, yeah. job. But, um, yeah. but at the same time, it's just but again, it's us. It's about us being gentle with people. And realizing the pressures they're under and thinking, you know, just trying to help them along the way and to see the bigger picture of what the menu looks like. And here's, you know, here's what you can do. So they don't need to worry too much. They, they sort of know that they need to do this. Yeah. And actually, we're just a bit of an ally to support them doing it. It's not anything um, that difficult and it's working and, you know, we're getting good, good feedback from everyone. So um, long may it continue. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I get I guess kind of linked to that um is you know, if people people listening who have children themselves or perhaps work in a school and are thinking like you have mentioned that they might be struggling to get children to eat anyway. And so now if we're trying to encourage them to to try this new food, well, they you know, we might already have fussy eaters and and so how do we go uh, about approaching those children but I mean you kind of have already touched on this already in, in terms of the um, you know the tasting presenting foods with with no pressure um, yeah. but I, I don't know is there anything else that you want to mention around fussy eaters and, and, and I how I don't can think so them? I think it is you okay. know it's that simple it is just trying yeah. things it's picking foods that kids already like or similar to and you're just moving through that you know along that line really um I think if you try something, trying things in different ways, you know, vegetables, um, kids often like kind of crunchy raw vegetables with things with dips, you know, mm. the classic peppers and cucumbers and tom cherry tomatoes, but also roasting vegetables. That's another thing, you know, that kind of brings out the flavor, makes it sweeter. Yeah. We Nobody, you know, I have memories of soggy boiled cabbage at school. <laughs> Thankfully, I never see that on menus anymore yeah. but that put me off cabbage you know for a good few decades um, <laughs> until I discovered actually you can cook it differently and it's delicious and it's now one of my favorite foods um, so it's how you prepare it and you know we mm. don't want to scar children for life with their experience of vegetables we want it to be delicious blitz things up put them in a dip you know whatever it is to kind of make a soup all these things that they're, they're you know there's lots of ways to do it it's just kind of being a little bit creative and not, you know, um, le letting them accept it and enjoy it. That's yeah. the most important part of food, isn't it? That we enjoy it. Yeah, blitzing is a really good point. You can, because it's understandable <laughs> that some people might not enjoy the the texture of, say, mushrooms or yeah. onions and and different things. But if you whiz these things up to make your pasta sauce, okay. um, you, you just don't know they're in there, do you? And, and it's really and different. You know, we'll we'll. 
in Scotland, for example, they serve, we see lots of soup served um, as mm. a sort of first course before the main course. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll say to the council, what's, which is the favourite soup? Lentil soup, which is a big thing in Scotland. Um, and I'm just like, God, imagine if, you know, kids <laughs> in England would eat lentil soup. That would be amazing. Or we'll do something with cauliflower and the, the caterers will say, oh, you know, the kids hate cauliflower. They'll, they won't like the cauliflower. We'll go somewhere else and make the same dish and they'll, they'll say, oh, they'll love this because they love cauliflower or the mushrooms or whatever it is. So it's just what they've been exposed to. They're not different children. You know, they're all the same, but it's just what kind of exposure they've had to these foods and how has it been. It, you know, if we've had a bad experience with something, it kind of puts you off wanting to have it again. If you have a bad product, you think, okay, I might give that a miss. Yeah. So it's exactly the same. We just got to make it as good as possible, I think. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think even sometimes when you eat something when you're ill, you can be put off that uh, for, yeah. for a while, can't you? It's really strange. Sure. Like you, your favorite dish all of a sudden could be like become repulsive for a couple of weeks. It's really strange. Anyway, yeah. that's a bit off topic. Um, you also mentioned about roasting vegetables, and that just makes me think that is what I love to do. My favorite thing to cook at the moment is a roasted sweet potato and cauliflower and lentil curry but oh, roasting the sweet potato and cauliflower and then cooking your curry on the side and then adding those roast adding those two roast vegetables oh, it's just it's so nice and so sweet like you said yeah. and you don't have to think about <laughs> it you just chop it all up and no. chuck it in the oven and away you go it's, exactly um, low, low input yeah yeah low input and cheaper like you mentioned as well yeah. i definitely noticed the difference in my aldi food bill um, <laughs> it's just so much cheaper That's good. Oh, man. well it's just been, it's it's been great to 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 hear more about the school plates program you know to hear about these delicious men um these delicious foods that you are that you're encouraging schools to to serve um, the fact that they're so well received the fact that we know that they are nutritionally adequate and everything children are getting everything they need from from these dishes and they're enjoying them we just need to give children the the opportunity to try them and step-by-step step approaches and, and and we can really start to make a difference because like you said thousands of children are eating these dinners and i think you quoted what millions of of, of uh dishes served um yeah. and these are so much more, so much more healthy, so much more better for the planet. Yeah, so how can people get involved then? Do they go to the um, website and sign up? Yeah. So the obvious thing is go to the website, proveg.com. Um, it takes you through to our UK site um, and have a look at school plates on there. We've got a section about school plates and you can, if you scroll down the page, you'll see you can download the guide and the recipes. So they're two free resources um, the guide just explains the program and if you're a school you know the, the facts behind what it's all about and how to do it mm. and the recipes as it as it suggests are the recipes we've created so they're aimed at primary schools um, yeah and it's all, all the work's kind of done for you there also our awards handbook which again I mentioned the award scheme um, <clears throat> that's on a separate bit but it's still within school plates but you can download that and have a look and you know, have a have a look at your menu, see how you think it measures up, um, and feel mm. free to send those in to us. Um, I think also we've got our um, our online webinars, which are for schools or anyone mm. who wants to just know a bit more. So that's a lovely, just a one hour session. You don't have to speak, you don't have to be seen. You can just sit there in silence and listen to us gibber on. Um, I talk a little bit about some of the facts, but very briefly. And then our lovely chef Lisa cooks up some of the recipes, usually about four or five recipes each time. Um, and we've got a blog on our website. So again, proveg.com, there's a blog about the workshop. So it's got all the dates of them, all the links to sign up on Zoom. So mm. I would suggest that. And again, if anyone's got any questions, um, do, do drop me an email. It's schools with an S at proveg.com um, and we'll pick that up and come back to you yeah amazing and this is all free right isn't it's it these free. resources and sign up yeah it's all free <laughs> come on listeners also, if make anybody it wants happen to donate that's great too yeah we of obviously course need yeah. money to keep doing this and we want to expand and be able to tackle it all much more quickly yeah. than we're doing but yeah we have to just go at the speed and the resource that we have so that's what we're doing for now yeah 
but you're definitely all making a difference. And yeah. and schools, you know, they, they want to show that they are being more climate aware and, and eco-friendly. And I think this is just such a, mm. it can be such a quick win, can't it, that mm. actually has so many wins involved in it, not just the saving the money, not just making your organisation, your school more um, eco-friendly, but actually... Just, just so much more goes along with that as well, doesn't yeah, it? And the fact true. that it's all for free, it's just brilliant. Yep. Brilliant. Give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Right, well, I can't let you go until I've asked you the, the final three questions that I like to ask every single guest. Okay. And the first question is, um, what's that one lesson that you wish you had been taught when you were younger? Um, I've got two, if I'm allowed to. So I've got, of course, I think yeah. the, 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 the first one, the obvious one that I'm going to say is, learning about the true cost of our food and where it comes from. Um, it's something that I didn't learn at school and I've only learned it much later in life, really. Um, and children soak up this information. So I think that would be something I would definitely want to see. And I think the other thing not to do with food is about focusing on the thing that you're naturally good at doing. Um, and again, and just excelling at something and whatever your natural skill tendencies are you, I, my experience now looking back is you kind of come back to those things that maybe mm. were, were there all along um yeah that would be my that's what I would like to see yeah love both of them I think sometimes we can be almost pressured into addressing our weaknesses can't we yeah. rather yeah, than just exactly. celebrating our strengths and just going exactly. with that yeah. yeah so that's a really good point yeah. um the second question is, what's one habit that you think I could either introduce to my life or take away from my life that would make me feel great and make the f people around me feel great? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, Maybe I, it's a habit that you've got, a daily habit that really helps you. Yeah, well, I, th I think, um, well, for me, my good daily habit is walking dogs. That is the thing nice. that brings joy to my life every day and gets me out, yeah. whether it's raining or... Um, yeah so that so if you haven't got a dog get a dog for sure get a rescue though <laughs> yeah yeah of course <laughs> that would be now, I live in an apartment life. I would absolutely okay. love a dog but unfortunately I, I can't in this in, in the okay. apartment I live One but day. you know exactly exactly <laughs> for day. sure my my dad's got a um a cockapoo that I absolutely oh, adore gorgeous. I just love going to see him yeah gorgeous and just the friendliest most cuddly little dog you've ever met it's, she's amazing oh, gorgeous. <laughs> and the the last question is um might be a bit of a thinker again but it's if you could give everyone in the world one book to read what would that one be one book be okay um and the one book I have given a lot of people to read after ah, okay. I read it myself and I bought lots of copies um, is How Not to Die um, by yeah. Dr. Michael Greger. You probably know it. Um, yeah. Michael Greger is a guru of nutrition and one of my <laughs> heroes and was instrumental in me ch completely changing my life and everything I do mm. um, and working for ProVeg and changing my lifestyle and diet. Um, and his book is all about the kind of main causes, the top causes, you know, of death basically in America. And here's what you can do to avoid that. So it sounds a bit sinister. But it's actually a really mm. positive, enlightening read that's totally based on evidence. Yeah. So I thoroughly recommend that. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. And I've got his, the kind of the offshoot of that, the How Not to Diet yes. book. Yes. Which is related to I think to, I've got know, that one too. Like, Oh, really great. How Not to Die would be my favourite. <laughs> oh, okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, well, thank you again, Colette. Um, I think we've mentioned... Me. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Thank you for your time. Um, we, we've mentioned, I guess, the, the website and, and ways that people can get involved. Um, people can find you as well, can't they, on social media? If, if, if there's any other links or social media handles that you want to mention, then please go ahead. <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah, our website that we've got, we're on, ProVeg is on pretty much every social media. So you'll find yeah. us, follow us, um, stay up to date. Um, if anybody wants to connect with me personally, the best way place to do it is on LinkedIn, Colette Fox, mm -hmm. and you'll see that I'm at ProVeg. Um, yeah, that, that's that's my most active uh, one. The others I neglect, so <laughs> don't, don't waste your time. 
<laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Uh-huh. Right. Well, thank you again. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to putting this, uh, putting this conversation out there and looking forward to staying in touch as well. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Sam. So thank you for tuning in. I hope you found my conversation with Colette Fox insightful. Do visit the ProVeg website to find out more about the School Plates programme. And if you did enjoy the episode, please share it with friends, family and colleagues who you think would find it interesting. You can also support the podcast by following and rating the show on whichever app you're listening on. Thank you again, and I look forward to bringing you another episode soon.